Uh, two or three notices just to say at the beginning of the service. I'm not there, so you can see them too. Uh, this coming Saturday is the stated annual meeting of the congregation, 10 o'clock in the morning. Try and be there if you possibly can. Uh, it's always interesting to hear various stories of what's going on. And we have two vacancies on the congregational board for members of the congregation. Just to put in the picture, the congregational board is made up of nine elders and nine other members of the congregation. So there's a rota, and uh, two people are coming off. That's Andrew Lane and Kath Henderson. They're both willing to be re-elected, but there are two other vacancies. So we're looking for two folk from the congregation who'd be willing to do a three year stint on the board, uh, which looks after the finances and the fabric of the church and the day to day running. So come along on um, Saturday for that. We're also at the stage with the building project where we're going to be asked to approve the following. At that meeting, the congregation will be asked to give approval for the Building the Future Steering Group to explore the project further Presbytery, General Trustees, Architects, Planning Authorities and Potential Funders with a view to bringing to a future meeting a more detailed project plan for discussion and approval. So it's not the starting line, it's getting approval for us to get towards the starting line. Um, but that's an important decision. It'd be good for the folk to hear about that. If you haven't looked at the plans, it's up the back there for all involved and look at them after. A couple of other quick things. The, uh, Saturday is also Earth Hour, when people all over the world put off the lights for an hour uh, in, I suppose, concern about the, the um, state of the environment. And we have a little service here from half eight to half nine in the evening in the, in the hall. Come along if you can, or if not, put the lights out, light the candle for an hour back at home. And the last one, I'm highlighting, they're all in the notices, which you'll get a copy of, pick one up through there or see it online. During Holy Week, every year, the pilgrims who are walking from Lanark to Lindisfarne, carrying a cross, always stop off in Selkirk on the Monday of Holy Week. So that's Monday the 3rd of April. In a lot of places, you just have to sleep on hard boards, but here in Selkirk, we have always prided ourselves in giving them all a bed for the night. So, I think at the moment, we believe there'll be 15 pilgrims, and I think I know of beds for about seven or eight of them. So, if any of you would like to volunteer, got a spare bedroom, a uh, bed or two, that you could put up a couple of pilgrims overnight, just, they'll be fed here, it's just overnight bed and breakfast in the morning. Please let me know so that we can offer our usual hospitality. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the time of worship and the time of communion uh, as well. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 95. Come, let us bow down and worship him. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people he cares for. We pick up on that psalm by singing our first hymn, hymn 59. Will come and let us to the Lord in songs and voices of praise. <laughs>
bring them before you this day as we come to worship you. Receive them with our grateful thanks for all that you are, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and use them for your glory, for your kingdom. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we come, come to you this on this your day. This is the day that you have made, so let us rejoice and be glad. For we are here to worship you, to enjoy your presence with us. And it is good that we are here today. It is good for us to share together in communion, to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, your Son, who died in our place on the cross at Calvary on Good Friday who gloriously rose from the dead on Easter Sunday. Lord, prepare us for sharing together in this special meal. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we have put our own needs before the needs of others. Forgive us for the times that we have loved ourselves more than we have loved you and those around us. Help us, Lord, to forgive those who have loved us. Lord, we thank you for this place of worship, for our brothers and sisters who are here with us this morning. We rejoice with each other. We sing your praises. We are eager to hear all that you have to say to us this day. Help us to listen, Lord, to what your Spirit is saying to us. Saying to us as a church, as individuals and families. Strengthen our faith in you, Lord, as we worship you this day. And hear us as we pray together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and now. Sing together, um, Graham Kendrick's wonderful hymn, From Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe, Babe also known as the Seventh.
Dad comes up with a, a, a reading. Um, I see we've got some children here today, so it's always nice to have some children. Thanks for an impromptu address. What, what's your names again? My name's Jennifer Right, hi there. Right, stand up and let me see how tall you are. Right, sit back down again. Right. Um, this story is about a very small person, and he was called Zach. He was really called Zacchaeus, but that's too hard to say. Um, oh, oh, I've got another one up here. What's your name? Right. So, right, Zach was a very small person. He lived in a place called Jericho. Now, Mrs. Guy now been to Jericho, and we've seen um, where he was because there's a tree there that they think is the same tree that Zach climbed up. He heard one day that Jesus was going to come to his town, to Jericho. And he'd heard all about Jesus. He'd heard that Jesus had done great miracles and he told wonderful stories and he'd done amazing things. So he said, I need to see this person, Jesus. But Zach, well, most people didn't like him. He was okay, but they didn't like him because he was a person... Well, he was called, he was a tax collector. Mums and dads and brides will tell you what taxes are. Uh, not, not the ones that you drive about in, but things that you pay money. And it's good because they go to schools and things like that and roads. Uh, that's where our money goes. But the thing was, Zach used to cheat some of the people. He would say, well, your tax is, is, is like 10. Say, let's say 10 pounds. But he would, he would sneakily say, well, it's 15 pounds. And the extra 5 pounds would go in his pocket. So that's why people didn't like him at all. And they said, right, we're not having anything to do, to do with this man, Zach. So when he was trying to see Jesus, there was a big crowd of people there, and he couldn't get anywhere near it. He kept jumping up and down to try and see over the topic because he was quite small, couldn't see them. And then he spied this tree, a sycamore fig tree it was called. So what he did was he went over to the tree and he climbed up the tree. Now, maybe you shouldn't climb trees because it's quite dangerous. So don't just tell me what Mr. Guy told you to climb trees. Right, so, but he climbed up and he had big robes on, so it was quite difficult. He climbed up and he just waited there until Jesus was coming along. Sure enough, Jesus and his disciples came along. And when, when Jesus got underneath the tree where Zach was, he looked up and he said, Zach! And Zach nearly fell out of the tree because he thought, how did Jesus know my name? He'd never, ever met him before. How did he know who I was? And he says, Zach, I'm coming to your house today for lunch. And Zach said, okay. And he scrambled down the, the, the tree very quickly and he took uh, Jesus back to his home, met his, his wife and family, and they had lunch together. And Jesus started speaking to Zach about how he was doing. And Zach knew that the things he was doing, cheating people, keeping all this money for himself, just wasn't right. So he says, right, Jesus, I know, I trust you, and I believe in you, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give half of my money away, half of all the money that I have, and if I have cheated anyone, I'll give them back one, two, three, four times as much money. So if I've cheated them out of five pounds, that'd be four times five pounds. What's four fives? Twenty, right? So he would give them, if he cheated them at five pounds, he would give them twenty back. So... And Jesus said, this is the right thing that you've done, doing, uh, Zach. And he said, well, a big word. He said, salvation has come to your house. You've been saved. You've trusted in me. And you're doing the right thing. So from that point on, well, Zach was quite well liked by all the people. Because he gave them back all the money. Four times over what he cheated. Because he believed in Jesus. And Jesus didn't really have to say all that much to him. He knew um, what Zach was like. And Zach knew by speaking to Jesus that he needed to do the right thing, that was to sort everything out, not cheat anybody, and then from that point on, he and all his family started to believe and to follow Jesus. So that's the story of a very small man called Zach. Right, you were very quiet and attentive. I hope, I hope the rest of the congregation was quiet and attentive when it comes to the sermon. <laughs> Cass going to come and read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 14 in your uh, few Bibles. You'll find it in the New Testament part at 226, page 226, 2 Corinthians 5, and verses 14 to 21. 
verse 14. We are ruled by the love of Christ. Now that we recognize that one man died for everyone, which means that all share in his death. He died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but only for him who died and was raised to life for their sake. No longer then do we judge anyone by human standards. Even if at one time we judged Christ according to human standards, we no longer do so. When anyone is joined to Christ, he is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making all mankind his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us the message which tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ, as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was made without sin, but for our sake, God made him share our sin in order that in union with him, we might share the righteousness of God. Amen. Day. So pray with me, everyone, for the ongoing war in Ukraine. Lord, you've created humankind with free will. We know that. Capable of wonderful good, but also of dreadful evil. But we have to pray, believing that you can and will rein in the worst excesses of human wickedness. When we read the reports from Ukraine, they're like the worst horrors of World War I. So we're praying that that war will end soon. And we're praying for the people who are grieving there over such loss, especially of loved ones, there but in so many other places and countries. Lord, be their strength and comfort now and always. Pray with me today for North Korean Christians. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. And I feel like we've been over them. Yes, I do. And why not? Suffering so terribly. In labour camps and in remote places. You know every one of them by name. Lord, be their supernatural strength and comfort. Now and always. Pray with me today for Malawi, a country with a profound Christian heritage and very strong connections with Scotland. Lord, there's terrible disaster in that country at the moment, with a huge loss of life, people losing whole families. Be their strength and comfort now and always. And please oversee the help and relief that is coming and will come to that country. Pray with me today for the controversy here in the UK over the refugee bill. Pray that that may be sorted out, solved, with respect to human needs and dignity and no loss of life. 
Pray with me today for our governments here in Holyrood and Westminster, wrestling with all kinds of issues and problems, that they may turn to you for wisdom. Pray with me that the witness of Christian MPs may be strong. Pray for the ongoing con uh, contest, I guess you could call it that, to replace Nicola Sturgeon as First Minister for the candidates involved that the right person may be chosen to do your will. Prayer, of course, must include thanks. So we do offer you our thanks and praise this morning, Lord, for the benefits we have here in Selkirk. All that the town is and has been to all of us. Freedom to worship being probably the most valuable and the most taken for granted for our church here, for all it means to us, praying for the future plans we have, that you will put your hand in them. And as always, we give thanks for our health service. It's under pressure, Lord, financially and other ways, but bless them working there. Give them strength every day. And we pray that this junior doctor strike, which could be so damaging to patients, could be sorted out. We pray for a quick replacement for Manager S. Jane at Open Door, that this valuable outreach may go on, giving thanks for all that she's done over eight years, bless her and blessing her in the new post. <coughs> we give thanks for Gordon Jonas improving health. <coughs> Put your healing hand on him, we pray. And we give thanks to for all that Ian, for Ian Watson's life for all that he did and was for the church when he was um, a church officer, but also his kindly helpfulness and willing, willing to help people. I used to call him crusty, helpful, friendly Ian in his yellow car. So we'll give thanks for him too and put your hand on his family too. <sighs> Lord, that's a lot of prayer, but there's one thing I've missed out and four nine, hymn 493 says it musically, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not David Taylor only, of course, but each individual one of us. Not my father, not my mother, not my brother, not my sister, not the stranger, not the neighbour. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Lots of prayer. Lots of us send lots of emails. Somebody described one's prayer as knee mail. Knee mail before God. So these knee mails, lots of them, we offer to you in your precious name this morning. Amen. <coughs> David for that uh, very moving prayer. I really like the, the knee mail. Um, maybe I was correct, but um, I think uh, David prayed for the family of Ian Watson. I understand that that was a rumour that has gone through the, 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 the town that, uh, that Ian is uh, alive and well. Sometimes these things uh, have happened. But that's the uh, understanding that, that I have that some people shared with me uh, this morning. So, um, We'll continue to pray for, for him and his, his family. And particularly today, let's uh, continue when we uh, think uh, on this Mothering Sunday, Mother's Day, of uh, our own mothers, um, past and present, um, and just uh, give thanks to God uh, for them. The hymn before our Bible teaching is 559, and on the screen goes, There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son, Precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One.
now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. We finish off this morning with a little mini series of uh, three uh, Bible teachings or sermons um, from the first few verses of Romans chapter 8. We'll read that in verse 1. For through Christ the Christian has been set free, set free from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin, and has received the Holy Spirit. We're no longer under condemnation, we're set free, we're given God's own spirit. But how has all this been brought about? How exactly has all this happened? Paul tries to explain a wee bit here, verses 3 and 4 of uh, Romans chapter 8, and it's verse, um, page 195 in the New Testament. Chapter 8, Life in the Spirit of Romans, just verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> what the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own Son, who came with a nature like man's sinful nature, to do away with sin. God did this so that the righteous demands of the law might be fully satisfied in us who live according to the Spirit and not according <coughs> to human nature. Amen. May God. And his blessing to the readings from his holy one. In his name be all the glory and all the praise. Paul says here it wasn't by keeping the, the law that we're put right with God. And when we think of the law, perhaps we, we focus on the Ten Commandments. It wasn't by keeping the law, these commandments, that brought our no condemnation about our freedom about. Because, well, because frankly, we're not very good at keeping the law, the commandments. We always fail, we always fall down, no matter how hard we try, because of our own sinful human nature. If we were able to obey the commandments, the law, then we would be put right with God because of our very allegiance. But we're not able to obey them because of the way that we are and the way that we continue to live. We can be greedy and selfish, jealous, proud, angry, lustful, but human nature is indeed sinful. The Ten Commandments are good, God gave them to Moses and to us for a purpose. Several purposes, in fact. They're good in themselves in that they are God-given. They are right and just. But they cannot put us right with God. And that's not their fault, but back to our fault, because we cannot keep them. So if it wasn't the law, the commandments that restored us, brought us back to God, how did it come about? Paul says, God brought us back to himself. We couldn't do it for ourselves, so God, our Creator, did it for us on our behalf. He didn't just commiserate with us and say, well, I've given you my law, my commandments, and I've shown you how to, to live, to keep these commandments, but you've chosen to go your own way, to live your way and not mine. You've chosen what was the easier option. Thankfully, God didn't do that, although he may well have been entitled to do so. God gave each one of us, every single one of us, a wonderful opportunity to come back and be reunited with himself. And he did this, as we know, by sending his own son. We all know of Sir Harry Rodham, the great Scottish uh, entertainer of a bygone era. Keep right on to the end of the road and so on. Sadly, Harry lost his uh, only son in the First World War. And he was told a story one day, a very touching story, um, by a man who visited him when he was in New York. In America, the towns um, that had given uh, a son to the war were entitled to place a star in the window of their homes. The man told Harry Lauder how a few nights before he and his wee boy were walking down one of the big avenues in New York City. The wee boy was very interested in the lighted windows and the stars that he saw in each one of them. And he would clap his hands each time he saw one and said, look daddy, there's a star, there's another one, and look, there's two. At last, the wee boy and his father came to a gap through the big apartment buildings in New York. And in the darkening sky, shining brightly, was the evening star. Oh, look, Daddy, said the wee boy. God 
wants to get into his son, for he has a star in his window. And God did indeed get his son. God sent his son. He didn't just send us a man, a prophet. Now did he send an angel or even an archangel? He sent his own son. He sent us the very best that he could, his only son. There could be no greater gift than that. God's own son. All that God is, he is. It was God himself who came down at Christmas time. Emmanuel, the name, the name means God with us. So God sent his son in the likeness of sinful man. The living Bible says he sent his own son in a human body like ours, except that ours are sinful. Sinful. He sent his own son in a human body like ours, except that ours are sinful. God sent his own son in a human body, or the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word was God. God's son is fully God. He is divine, he has a divine nature, but he was sent in a human body. He was born of a woman, of Mary. He was also therefore fully human. That's hard for us to understand. We think, is he not half and half? But no, he was fully God and fully human. He had a divine nature and a human nature. He was fully God and fully man. So Jesus is God. He cured diseases. He made dead people come alive again. He changed the weather. He walked on water. He forgave sins. He destroyed evil. And he even came back from the dead. Jesus is God. Jesus is man. He was born as we are, as a baby. He grew up. He felt hungry, he felt tired, happy, thirsty, sad. The heat and cold affected him as it affects us. The pain affected him just as it affects us. He slept and walked and ate and drank and laughed and cried just like we do. He was tempted to do wrong just as we have. Jesus is man and God together. Fully man, fully God. We must always try to understand him in that way, even though it may be difficult. As we look together at what Jesus has done for us and try to understand why being fully God and fully man was absolutely necessary. He had to be man and God together. God sent his son in the human body like ours, except that ours are sinful. And there is a difference, a big difference between you and I and Jesus Christ. He was like us in every single way. As I said, he slept, he walked, he was hungry, he cried, just like we do. He was tempted to do wrong, just as we are. But he never gave in to that temptation. And that's the big difference. He never committed a single sin. And we commit so many. You and I give in to temptation and sin. But Jesus never did, and that's very, very important. What proof do we have of this? other than the statements here in Romans chapter 8. What about Luke chapter 1, verse 35? Rachel Gabriel tells Mary of the wonderful son that she is to give birth to. It's Christmas time. She refer, uh, he refers, Rachel Gabriel refers to the son as the Holy One. And to be holy means to be without sin. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, we read, um, describes Christ as he who knew no sin. The writer to the Hebrews says, he was tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus even himself challenged the, the Pharisees and others and says, if any of you can accuse me of sin, then come forward and do so. No one came forward. It's very interesting when we see, read the story um, in the beginning of, of, of John 8, um, about the woman caught in adultery and Jesus um, asked them to come forward those who are without sin to come forward and as we know in that story no one came forward but then Jesus came forward and spoke to the woman and encouraged her to go and sin no more he came forward because he was the only one without sin and so God well, God destroyed sin's control over us. 
by giving Jesus his son as a sacrifice. All along, our problem has been this man of sin. All of us were under its control, as we saw a bit last week. That's why we see we can't keep the commandments because sin controls us. The power that sin has over us has to be broken, and only God Himself can do that. And He does that by giving us His Son as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. The New Testament teaches us that the main purpose in Jesus coming into this world was to deliver us from sin and condemnation by becoming a sacrifice for our sins. The, old, the whole of the Old Testament teaches the same truth. All the burnt offerings and sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament were just a foreshadowing of the one ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, the Son of God. That's why John the Baptist, when he saw him coming, says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Lambs were also often used in sacrifice. The whole idea of the sacrifice in the Old Testament was that because sin results in, in death, an animal was chosen, an animal without spot or blemish, was chosen to represent the people. They had to identify with that animal. The sins of the people were in some way transferred onto that animal. The high priest was, would lay his hands on that animal and the sins of the people would be forgiven for another year. Such sacrifices obviously had to be repeated year after year after year. But now God has provided the ultimate sacrifice that never needs to be repeated. His own Son, a once and for all sacrifice. He is our representative. If we identify with Him, if we believe that in Christ, in some wonderful supernatural way, took all our sins upon Himself on that cross at Calvary, that they were dealt with there that they were condemned, then, then, and only then, will sin's power control over us be destroyed forever, if we trust in Christ. Sin's power over us will be destroyed, because there, in the body of Jesus, the human body, all of our sins were killed off forever. And because of Christ's sacrifice, sin no longer has a hold on us. We are no longer dominated or influenced by sin if we trust in, the, in Christ who sacrificed himself. All of this, says Paul in verse 4, says, All of this has been done in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully satisfied in us. How can they be satisfied in us if we can't keep them? We need to live a life of obedience and holiness. But we can't do that. God's law is powerless to provide such a life because we are powerless, because we cannot live such a perfect life. But now, what the law was powerless to do, God has done. Now that God's own Son, sent to earth in the likeness of sinful man and woman, sinful flesh, has given his, his life as a sacrifice for our sins, he has died on our behalf. The death, death sentence has been carried out him. Because you see, Jesus lived a life in which, as we saw, he never gave in to temptation. He never sinned. Sin had no power over him as it has a hand over us. And so it was effectual on the cross. He overcame sin by his death because he had committed no sin. It was our sins that God's wrath was poured out on on the cross. And as we know, even in death, sin could not hold him. Because following on from that sad Good Friday is the wonderful Easter Sunday when Jesus is alive and alive forevermore. He has won a great victory over sin and over death. And so there is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Or, as some translations say, as we said last week, um, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we saw a wee example when I tried to compare it of, of being uh, in Adam, in Adam's boat, heading for disaster, or being lifted out by Christ into his boat, in Christ's boat, heading for life. But there's much more to that we word, or two words, in Christ, than even that. <coughs> to be in Christ Jesus means to share 
in all that he has done, in all that he has achieved, in all that he has done for us on the cross and by his resurrection. This means that all who are in Christ, who belong to him, share in the great victory over sin. It wasn't just Jesus' victory, it is our victory because he did it on our behalf. His victory is now ours. He has conquered sin and death, and in some way, so have we. The fruits of that victory are his. Jesus met every requirement of the law with his life, because he did not sin, and his death. He fully satisfied the righteousness of the law that Paul talks about here. And since Jesus fulfilled the law in every respect, as Christians, we have fulfilled the law because we are in him. It is not us, but it is him. And if we belong to him, we are in Christ. Since we are united with him, God looks at us and sees us in the same way as he sees Jesus as son. He sees us as perfect. Not because we are perfect, we are very imperfect. Not because we kept the law and the commandments, but because Jesus did. Because Jesus was perfect. Because he kept the law. Because he paid the price for our sins. I conclude with these words from a familiar hymn. When Satan tempts me to despair, and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look, and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is, sat is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. Shall we pray? Lord God, it's difficult for us to understand all about your Son being fully human and fully divine, and yet that is what he was. Lord God, we thank you for what you've done in him. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you took all our sins upon yourself, that you lived as one of us, except you did not give in to temptation, you struggled in different places, in the desert, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and at other times. But you did not give in to temptation. Lord Jesus, you were the perfect sacrifice. And so amazingly, Lord God, when you look on your Son, as he died on the cross, the pardon. Lord God, help us to focus upon that. Because the sinless Saviour died, our sinful souls are counted free. Lord, help us to focus upon that. And in all that your Son Jesus accomplished for us on the cross and by his wonderful and glorious resurrection. Thank you for these words that you've helped us to understand this day. Help us to live them out in our lives and to proclaim the good news to all who we have, whom we come across. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and enable us to tell that good news wherever we go. For we pray in Jesus' name. Communion, we sing um, Francis Alexander's wonderful uh, hymn, uh, usually sung at Easter time, but this prepares us for Easter. There is a green hill far away, outside a city wall, where the dear Lord was crucified. He died to save us all. We just need to keep singing. <laughs>
Welcome to the Lord's table. His table is open to all who love him. And we therefore invite all those who love the Lord Jesus to share in this meal together, to join with him and with each other in holy fellowship. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. All who believe in me will never thirst. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me never cry again. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, not one of us are worthy to receive your sacrament, but you have given us your own righteousness through your Son Jesus, and in his name we offer you this bread and this cup, that they may remind us of all that you have done for us on the cross and by your resurrection and continue to remind us of your continuing love for each one of us for we pray this in jesus name amen during his time on earth jesus often enjoyed meals with those he called his friends <coughs> to show them how closely he belonged to them at the last supper he broke bread and poured wine as signs of his sacrifice that he would soon make for each one of us, the sacrifice of his own body and his own blood. He told his disciples, his followers, to follow his example and so remember him. And that is why we have a Lord's Supper or communion today. We are called to be his followers and so we respond to his invitation and to his command. Shall we pray? Lord God, our Father, we thank you for all that you are. We thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus, who lived amongst us, who shared our joys and our sorrows, who showed us your love, who healed the sick, who raised the dead, who was a friend to the outcast and the sinner. Lord, in obedience to you, he took up his cross and died there for us. Lord God, we praise you. We praise you that Christ is not dead but alive. And by your Holy Spirit lives and works in our hearts and lives today. We thank you for your Spirit, Lord, and the power and love which he gives to us. Father, send your Holy Spirit now to bless and consecrate these gifts of bread and wine, so that we may be drawn together and joined to Christ Jesus our Lord, that we may receive new life in him, follow him with our lives, until we feast once more with him, and with you at that heavenly banqueting table. And as we share in the body and blood of Christ, may we ourselves become living sacrifices, dedicated to serving you and pleasing in your sight. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> we give our thanks to the Lord Jesus on a night when he was betrayed took some bread. And after giving thanks to God, Jesus broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, 
which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So in the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup. Say, this cup is a new relationship with God, sealed with my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, do this to remember me. This is the blood of Christ, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, do so to remember him. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for all that we have received from you in this sacrament. For you have united us with your Son Christ and reminded us of his sacrifice for each one of us on the cross. Lord, you have given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out from here in the power of your Holy Spirit to live and work to your pray, praise and glory for the name and the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. From the fight returned victorious, every knee to him shall bow. Crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him. Crowns become the victor's crown. Thank you. 